why we don't have lyrics up on a screen on Sunday morning because our brother has no idea what's getting ready to happen when he sits behind the piano. <laughs> but so each each Sunday it's like there's a different flow in worship. It's, it's like there's a different song that's coming out through the medley of songs. And I loved how this morning it was his goodness is chasing after us. He's faithful. It is well, even in the midst of tragedy and difficulty and questions. And then there was, oh, bring restoration. He restores things. He's still the God of the wind and the waves. Yeah. So beautiful, man. Did you know that that song, It Is Well, was written in the midst of incredible tragedy? I'm sure most of you know the story of that song. Horatio Spoffer, he just lost his wife and children and uh, the, the ship went down. He's, he's, he's going across the ocean to England. The spot where the ship went down that was carrying his wife and children, as he's sailing over that spot, he writes the lyrics, It is well with my soul. Isn't that amazing? This, this story of he's faithful, he's good. I don't understand, but I know he's good. It is well with my soul. Makes that song a little bit more powerful now, doesn't it? Yeah. It's amazing. Well, many of you are wondering why I'm standing here. <laughs> I'm supposed to be in India right now. God had a different plan. Man plans in his heart, and God directs his steps, right? Yeah. I sat for four hours on the San Luis Obispo tarmac on Friday, excited and prepared to go to Mumbai, India, to speak at a pastor's conference. A very short window of time to get there, and... God had a different plan. Uh, flight was canceled, missed my window, and here I am. I literally had just prayed as I was sitting on the, the tarmac, 
You are the God of Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. Wow. Lord, it's in your hands. I trust you. You're good. Whatever you want to happen. And then not five seconds later, the pilot comes over the intercom. Folks, we're going to turn back to the gate. It looks like it's going to be another hour and 45 minutes before we have clearance to take off. And that was that. So here I am. Uh, before I get to a very special point of the day, I have a couple of announcements that I want to share with you guys. We are, if you don't know about our Thursday night gatherings, every Thursday night we gather together for a meal, we share the Lord's Supper, we take communion together, we worship and we pray. It's a beautiful time together. We do that every Thursday night and we would encourage you guys to come and join us on Thursday nights. Now, this month is a little different because many of us are fasting through the month, so we're not going to be having a meal on Thursday nights, but we will still be gathering for worship and prayer. So we normally gather at 6 p.m. For the month of January, we're gathering at 6.30. Everybody say 6.30. Everybody say, don't come hungry. <laughs> yes, but still come and join us. So speaking of fasting, many have already started fasting for the beginning of the year. Uh, some folks, we're going to be doing a corporate fast as a church family starting next Sunday, January 15th. It's going to be a 21-day fast. I'm going to talk more about that next week, but we would encourage you to give the Lord th this time at the beginning of the year by way of prayer and fasting. If, if you've never given yourself to extended seasons of prayer and fasting, then I encourage you, let this be the beginning of something that God has given to us as a gift. I brought some books with me, uh, some resources that are fantastic. If fasting intimidates you, if you have so many questions about fasting, you don't know where to start, I'll leave these on top of the piano. And a lot of these uh, can answer your questions. If you don't feel like reading books and you just want some answers, I'd love to talk to you. Many others here are familiar with fasting, and, and they can help answer questions too. One of the books that I have here is written by Franklin Hall. It's called Atomic Power with God Through Prayer and Fasting. And I was looking through this this morning, and it has 100 reasons why we should fast. So I'm going to read you all 100. I'm joking. I'm just going to read a couple. This book is really fascinating because it was written in 1946. Now, it, it, at that point in church history, in modern church history, fasting was not something that the church regularly did. Obviously, there were some folks who, who did have a rhythm of fasting in the church, but it's not like today where it's commonly talked about, where there's lots of books that are written about it, where there's sermons that you can listen to about fasting. It was this kind of unknown mystical thing. So this brother comes along in 1946, writes this book about the atomic power of prayer and fasting, and it ignites something in the church. Now, what happened in the late 1940s in the church? Healing revival. The revivalists broke out. Billy Graham began his ministry in 1947. William Brannan, A.A. Allen, Jack Coe, Oral Roberts, all of these guys got a hold of the revelation of fasting, and what happened? We're now talking about those guys today and what God did in the late 1940s and 1950s. It's no coincidence. Now, was fasting responsible for that? No. But did fasting contribute to what God did in the church? Absolutely. Fasting is a gift that God has given us. So anyway, I want to read a couple of these reasons why we should fast according to our brother Franklin Hall. Just a couple. Fasting takes one into humility. Fasting brings us into humility. Fasting removes pride. Fasting intensifies the power of prayer. Fasting brings one face to face with reality. I like that one. Fasting brings us face to face with reality. A full belly is not reality. Just travel to any other part of the world and you will see that the comfort and luxury that we have at our tables 
is not reality. Fasting brings one face to face with reality. Fasting brings one into direct contact with unbelief so that it can be removed. Unbelief can never be fully comprehended until one fasts extended seasons. Fasting masters the old man and, give, and gives him a powerful beating. <laughs> I love that. Fasting masters the old man and gives him a powerful beating. I love that. Fasting will crucify the flesh and break bad habits. Amen to that. Fasting is the easiest way for backsliders to come home. Just study King David. Fasting slows down carnality and unnatural desires. Fasting places our natural appetites in a dormant condition. Thus, physical pleasures are not enjoyed. With pleasurable appetites now static, God can draw near to us and we can draw near to Him. He is contacted and a revival begins. And the last one I'll read. Fasting brings one nearer to Christ than any other known process. For me personally, this is why I fast. I want my heart to become tender and I want to touch him. I want to touch him in a way that, that is a little bit more challenging just in the normal rhythm of life. And fasting brings us to that place of desperation. Lord, I need you. Tenderize my heart. Humble me. Allow me to see you. So I would encourage you, fast with us. If you have questions, please ask me any of those questions and I'll do my best to answer them. So next week we'll begin the fast. During the fast, we're going to have Tuesday night prayer gatherings in different homes. So we're going to do the first one on January 17th. It's going to be at Roger and Roxanne's house in Orchid. That's going to start at 6.30, and then I'll tell you about the other ones later. But every Tuesday night during those three weeks of fasting, we're going to have an additional prayer meeting. Brother, if you want to go ahead and begin passing the baskets for the offering, that'd be great. Here we are. And there's a little uh, helper here this morning that wants to help you. Want to bring me some Mr. Jonathan? No? Are you getting shy now? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, bro. If you're ever able, not able to join us on a Sunday morning and you want to listen to the message, all those are on the website, pearlchapel.com. We also have them on Spotify and iTunes playlist if you want to join in with those messages. Well, I have the distinct honor of introducing Lindsay, my incredible wife, to you this morning. Lindsay's going to share the word, and one thing that I'm excited about this morning is obviously getting to see it in person, to be here in person, but what she's going to share with us is something that, it's not just a message that she's prepared, it's something that she embodies. She embodies this message. The kids and I, we see it all the time. Different ones who have been invited into our home have seen it. And if you have not had that opportunity, you, you soon will. This is a, mo uh, a message that Lindsay walks out daily. It's something that the Lord has formed in her. So these aren't just words. This isn't just something pretty that she's strung together. This is something that she embodies. So I want to pray over the offering. I want to pray over Lindsay. And she can get to work. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing in this house and in this family. Lord, I thank you for the ones that you are drawing to yourself or the ones that are giving financially to the work here. Lord, I pray that you bless them. Lord, that you return to them a hundredfold what they're sowing into the work here. Lord, I thank you for Lindsay, the blessing that she is to me, and to the kids, and to so many others. Lord, I pray that you baptize her in your spirit right now. Lord, that she would be anointed to deliver your word. 
that she would speak as an oracle of God and that you would give us ears to understand what you are saying. Lord, this is such an important message for us to grab hold of. Lord, let us not have ears that do not hear, but give us ears that hear what you are speaking to your body. We love you and we give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Uh, in vision today, uh, I thought you weren't going to be here. <laughs> and I was going to get you all to myself, um, but I'm glad you're here. And I want to honor Neil because I had the opportunity to get this up and for him to get up here and to speak today, but he was insistent that I was to be up here and I was to do this. He was insistent from the beginning and straight through, and I think because of that, I feel like my voice is honored by you, and it's honored in this house, and it's important. So that means a lot. Thank you. All right, let's begin. We will begin in Romans 12. I'll begin reading in verse 9. So if you're flipping and you're looking for it, you're going to find it under the heading of how to behave like a Christian. Some versions may say marks of a Christian. I need this. I think maybe we all do. So I'll begin reading in verse 19, and I'll finish in 13. Let love be without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil. Hold fast or cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, servant in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given over to hospitality. There are other versions that say pursuing the practice of hospitality. Opening your home to guests. So that's where we're focusing on is the practice of being given over to hospitality. I'm going to start with a story because I love stories. When Neil and I first started following the Lord, we found ourselves with a group of 20-something-year-olds and we were starting a church plant in this small town in North Carolina, and we were full of so much excitement. The first step to this church plant was that all the leadership was to take these, uh, it was like a spiritual aptitude test. Picture like a Myers-Briggs personality test, but for the church. They were trying to figure out where we would serve best. So everybody takes the test. We finish our test, and, and people are getting their results back, and it's so exciting. Like, oh, I got leadership, or I got, you know, teaching, and I look at my results, and I got hospitality. <laughs> and I was like, no, this is the worst. Like, I'm thinking, could I have gotten leadership? Like, I think I could do okay. Honestly, I was hoping for demon slaying. That's fun. <laughs> But I was not the showy, sparkly result of the aptitude test. I was hospitality. So as a result, this church plant put me in the children's department, which I love. I, lo I was happy to be there. However, I was not able to teach. They did not give me that because it was not on my aptitude test. They had me filling up goldfish cups. <laughs> And I can laugh about it now, but in the moment, I was so upset and so frustrated because I thought, how did I get relegated to the back room where nobody sees me, nobody knows what I'm doing, and all I'm doing is filling up goldfish cups. And it honestly wasn't until I started putting get together this message and really thinking about it, and I thought, wow, like, that really, looking back on it, is an indictment against my 20-something-year-old self that couldn't see the beauty of hiddenness and the beauty of, of honoring this 
this call that the Lord placed on me, pursue hospitality, but I want you to do it in a place that nobody's going to see it. And I think I missed an opportunity to both minister to the Lord, but even to be able to touch the heart of God and as a result minister to these kids and their teachers and their parents. I missed the mark. <laughs> I didn't learn that in the moment. Years down the road, when we had kind of wrapped up our season with this church plant, I took this little aptitude test and this, this call to pursue hospitality, and I shoved it in a drawer. I thought, I'm not dealing with you. I don't want to do this. I'm picturing, like, the Lord is asking me to be like Martha Stewart, and I do not want to be this person. This is not me. So I put it in the drawer. I put it away, and I completely ignore it as if it never happened. It wasn't until years down the road that Neil and I were part of a church, and I sat under some really great teaching um, on hospitality. Scott Volk, write his name down, he has a podcast called Portions, and if you're ever wanting to learn more about biblical hospitality, he carries that message so beautifully. So I was able to sit under, under his teaching, and I remember the first time he talked about hospitality, it was like that familiar word, and my reaction to it was, okay, shut down, I'm not listening to this. But as I listened, I realized, like, wow, there's a lot of beauty in carrying this gift well, and there's a lot of um, power and authority in operating in hospitality and pursuing hospitality. So I pull it out of the drawer, and I'm like, okay, I can do this. So the Lord calls our family to the Middle East, to Iraq. It is a culture that is marked by extreme hospitality. You go to a place, and you can't say no to tea. And it's not just tea. I'm right, right? You have to sit. It's tea, it's cookies, it's conversation. And you better not act like you need to leave too quick. Like, you are there. So the Lord called us to this place, and I'm carrying this, this little um, desire to be more hospitable. And I walk into this culture, and it is just, it stretches and stretches and stretches me in this. Because while it's a culture built around hospitality, it, it doesn't carry the hospitality of the kingdom. And everything I bumped into, because the culture was abrasive, there were parts of me that wanted to put up walls because it was abrasive. There were encounters with people that were hurtful, so it's wall, wall, wall. And the Lord was constantly putting doors into those walls. And those doors were hospitality, like you have to be open to people. And so um, Iraq was really formational. I'll tell another story. We had a man that we befriended in Iraq. He was the team's driver. He would drive the team into Mosul and out of Mosul. Mosul was a really difficult town to get into and out of. Um, but this guy, because he had history in the military, really, really rough around the edges. He's like textbook Iraqi Arab. He would drive us into town and out of town. He could get us into places that no other human could. So Neil had developed a very unique relationship with him. Our family loved him. He was awkward and obtuse and challenging to love, but we really liked him a lot, and we spent a lot of time with him. The time that we spent with him was like in and out of cars and um, you know, in and out of buildings, and so Neil and I thought, we really need to have him in our home, and I knew it was going to be difficult, and I knew it was going to be a challenge, but we thought this is, that we need to do this, so we had repairs that needed to be done, and we put him in charge, which he was so pleased with himself to be in charge of all of the things going on in our house, so he came over, he stayed all day, all day, and I remember I'm in the, the kitchen, and I'm trying to do homeschool with the kids, but then also I'm aware of him. And because he's a Middle Eastern man, he's got an expectation of what I'm supposed to do for him that day. So I'm like, Lord, 
I need your help to host this man well. And so I would see him every maybe hour, hour and a half, hand in the air, and he called me Linza. He didn't even know my name. Linza, Linza, and he would point down he needed more teeth. But this wasn't like boil some water, put a bag, like you're cooking chai for him. I don't know how many pots of chai I made that day, but he stayed and he came back the next day and the next day. And um, one of the most uh, memorable things happened at the end of, of this time that we spent together. He showed up on our front porch. We answered the door. He had this wooden, um, these wooden justice scales in his hand. And he said, I have a gift for you. I want this in your house. And he said, when I was in your house and I watched you and your family and you and Neil together, I've never seen this before, but you, Linza, are equal to Neil. And Neil is equal to you. You are, you are balanced. And I've never seen this in family before. And it opened up such a beautiful opportunity to share with him, like, I'm submitted to Neil, but he serves me. And this is why you see this operating in our home. And it made space for us to, to walk out the gospel and him to see it in our home. It's something that would have never happened in the car and in between buildings. And so hospitality became something for me that was formational. So when Neil asked if I would share today, after saying, no, I don't think so, a couple times, <laughs> and him saying, no, it's a good idea, and then the Lord saying, yes, you need to do this, I started thinking, like, oh, what can I talk about? Naturally, because I still have this, like, tiny part of me that wants to tuck hospitality in a drawer, naturally I'm thinking, oh, I could talk about this, this is really good stuff, God, or I could, I could talk about, you know, fruit, or I could talk about, I'm thinking of all these things, and I'm sitting with this iPad and a blank screen. I, I had absolutely nothing. So it was at that moment I thought, I should ask the Lord what he wants me to talk about. <laughs> Probably should have started in that place, but I did not. So as I sat before the Lord, it was clear, it was hospitality again, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I can do this. But more specifically, what I want to talk to, or what I want to talk about, is the gospel of Jesus that we get to see through the lens of hospitality. Biblical hospitality is central to the gospel. In fact, three times in the New Testament, we hear these words, the Son of Man came, the Son of Man came, the Son of Man came. The first two we hear the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's Luke 19. Then we hear that the Son of Man came to serve and not be served. What I love about those first two statements is that they are both two statements. Their purpose, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man came to serve and not be served. The third one shows us his method. It's in Luke 7, and it says that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. It's his method statement. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to serve and not be served, and he came eating and drinking. To go further, that statement finishes with who he came to do that with. Tax collectors and sinners. That was, that was his focus. For sure, Jesus preached to the multitudes. For sure, there was space for proclamation and for preaching to the multitude. But when Jesus encountered the deeply broken, the hurt, the ones who were pushed aside, discarded, the ones who were alienated or on the fringes of society, he stopped. He stopped, and he looked them in their eyes, and he brought restoration. I love that you sang about that. <laughs> he brought restoration, and more often than not, he brought them to the table. Jesus extended hospitality. 
So the Son of Man came eating and drinking, a friend of the tax collectors and the sinners. So let's look at a couple of examples, won't you? So in Luke 19, we have the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was the worst of the worst of the worst. I love this story. I don't know if I love it so much because I sang the song so much when I was a kid. I sang it in the little hand motions. And I had this picture of this wee little man, and he was so cute in my mind. But when you really sit with this story, you realize there was nothing cute about him. He was, he had partnered with Rome to pillage his people. He, he was not a friend to anybody. And I would venture to say, I don't know for sure, but probably his mother and father did not have him over for dinner very often. Like he, the, he was not someone that his family would be proud of, and he wasn't someone that his people wanted to be near. And even though he worked for Rome, they didn't like him very much. So he had no friends. He was deeply despised by everyone. And Jesus is walking down the road, and he locks eyes with Zacchaeus, and he says, Hey, come down. We're going to eat together. It was costly for Jesus to extend this hospitality to Zacchaeus, but he did. Zacchaeus, dinner with Zacchaeus, was a reputation ruiner, but Jesus did it anyway. We have the two men on the road to Emmaus. They were disillusioned because they had just watched the one that they had put all their hope in, put all their chips on the table. They just watched him die on a cross, and they were scared. Like, Jerusalem was not an easy place to be at that moment in time as a follower of Jesus. So they were disillusioned, they were afraid, they were confused, and they are getting out of there. Jesus meets them, they invite him to the table, and it was at that place in the breaking of bread that Jesus was revealed to them, and it changed everything. They were no longer running away, saying, we don't know what we're doing or where we're going. They're now going to people and saying, Jesus is who he says he is. He restored these men at the table. Jesus restored Peter over breakfast, and he restored Mary over a meal. And while I, we don't know that he brought everyone to the table, one thing that we see consistently is that Jesus stopped. Jesus always stopped. He stopped for the woman with the issue of blood. He stopped for prostitutes. He stopped for the desperate. He even stopped for the Pharisee. He stopped for the leper. He stopped for the rich young ruler. And he stopped for the penniless beggar, penniless crippled beggar by the pool of Bethesda. Jesus always stopped because this is important. Biblical hospitality isn't just about a table. Tables are important. I love the table. But if it's just a meal, it's not biblical hospitality. Biblical hospitality is always about making space in your heart. It's always about making space in your schedule. It's always about putting a door where there is a wall. Biblical hospitality is always about letting people in that feel like an interruption. So go ahead and kind of put that in your head. Like if, if something feels like an interruption, it's an invitation for sure. The early church did this well. They mimicked Jesus' rhythm of hospitality. Acts 2 tells us that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the breaking of bread, that if they had too much, they shared it amongst themselves, and there was no need. No one had need. And I think I've always read that part as people's basic needs were met. I have more than enough shirts, so I'm going to share my shirts with him. So now you, you have shirts and you're not cold anymore, or come share a house with me, and 
food with me, and I always felt like maybe this is their basic needs were met, and I do believe that that's the case, but I think it goes deeper than that. I think the rhythm and the way that they lived their lives as they modeled the, the rhythm of Jesus' life is that these deep needs for friendship and these deep needs for community and communion and a, and a need for a space to belong and a space to become, these needs were also met. And what did God do? He added to their number. I love that it finished like that. The early church followed, followed the model of hospitality that Jesus himself walked out. And in doing so, they were able to reach across and smash social boundary lines and, and division. And they were able to establish a new social order that looked like the kingdom of God. John Mark Homer, I love this. He, uh, he says that this type of hospitality was primary to the way the gospel spread at such a rapid pace. It began as a few hundred people eating together in an upper room in Jerusalem and spread to over half the population of the Roman Empire in just three centuries. It did it table to table to table. So I want us to get hospitality is no small thing. This is the way that the gospel spread in the first century church. They were doing the stuff. It toppled paganism. The first century church didn't have the internet. They didn't have the printing press. They didn't have church buildings. They didn't have legal protection. They didn't have political power. All they had was the table and each other and the gospel spread. In fact, this, this I love, this I love. So originally, first century, very difficult to get medicines, very difficult to travel from place to place. It was the early church that opened their homes and their doors to the sick and the dying. Okay, We call places now that do that hospitals, but the word is actually taken from hospitality. The early church embodied this. They brought in people, they brought in strangers, and there was no need among them. Hospitality had such a place of importance that when we look in Timothy and Titus, we see Paul making hospitality a requirement for church elders and for church leaders. It was in Titus, Paul gives this long list of things that the, the church elders and the church leaders should have. They should be self-controlled. They should be upright. They should be walking in holiness. And they should be hospitable. It's right in those lines. I cannot think of the last time that I have heard of leadership being held to the mat because they don't show hospitality. I haven't. I could be wrong, but I haven't heard it. So it leads you to think, what has happened? Like, why is this not something that we see the church really embodying now, I think there's two things. I think the first is we have mistaken hospitality for entertainment. That's what I've done. Yeah. I look, I hear the word hospitality, and the first thing I think of is like a Martha Stewart magazine. Maybe I'm dating myself with that, but that's what I think of. I think of this like perfect situation. So we've, we've taken hospitality and we've looked at it like entertainment. And because that is really difficult, we kind of put it in a drawer and we close it. We don't look at it. And we get out hospitality when we're having a dinner party. And we pull it out when we set the table and we think, okay, we're doing the thing. A dinner party is not hospitality. I like dinner parties. I love setting a table. I love a pretty table. But dinner party is entertainment. Dinner party is not hospitality. Entertainment says, look at my perfect home. Look at my perfect meal. Look at my perfect kids. It's, it's got these defined boundary lines. 
you're going to come from this time to this time, and within this period of time, we can hold it all together and everybody's going to be happy and things are going to be perfect. <laughs> That's entertainment. That is not hospitality. And I think right now, the world doesn't want perfect. The world wants authentic and the world wants real. People aren't looking around wanting to be impressed. They want to find a home. And if we continue to walk out biblical hospitality as if it's entertainment, we're not bringing people into home and into family. We're just impressing them for a very short period of time. <laughs> right? Entertainment is an act of reciprocity, meaning I'm going to have you over, and in turn, either you're going to have me over or I have this expectation that I get something in return. Like, wow, that was a good meal. Or, you know, wow, you bought me coffee this time, I'm going to buy you coffee this time, and it's this back and forth act of reciprocity. That's entertainment. Hospitality is an act of generosity. It's giving without expecting anything in return. It's saying, I just want to be with you. I don't, I don't need anything. I don't need you to ever have me over to your house. I don't even need you to tell me thank you for a meal. I'm doing this out of a, a generosity of heart and an openness of heart. I have one more story. <laughs> one more story and one more example. I'm almost finished. So we had this friend, um, and he was, is a Muslim background believer, meaning he was Muslim, encounter of the Lord, now he's a believer, Muslim background believer, and he, we had a friendship with him, and had him over to our house quite a few times for meals, loved on him. But when he became a Christian, he lost everything. So he is, we're trying to express family to him, and we feel like we're doing it right. And then all of a sudden, we bump up next to he's alone, and he is starting to deal with repetitive sin issues that are sending him for a swirl. So, so where our whole team is like, what do we do about this? Because we think we're doing all this stuff, but this one that we're caring for, like, he's in a rough spot right now. And we realize, like, we, ha we have to open up. Like, we have to literally move him into our home so that he's surrounded by family, that we're actually doing the thing rightly. And so I realized in that moment, entertainment was having him over for a meal. And we thought we were satisfying that. But hospitality is saying, no, I, you're coming in and you're living with us. And we're going we're gonna to get this sorted out. We're going to do this right. And so he came into our house. It was really uncomfortable because when he would have a meal, we could, we could be like the, the missionaries who have it all together. But when he's in our house and there's conflict or we have to discipline a child or, you know, things aren't put together, like we really started to live in the friction of life together. I think at one point while he was there, well, I know for sure, like Neil and I had a disagreement about something and he's just standing there in our house and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like how do you navigate this with this guy that you know he's watching everything? So while he was there, Neil had all these books for him to read, and they were doing like book studies and Bible studies every morning. They would get up to pray every morning together. And at the end of his time in our house, we sat him down at the table, and Neil was like, so what was like most impactful for you? And we're thinking, oh, it for sure is like early morning prayer time. That was like, that was doing the stuff. So we're sitting there, and he says, you know, honestly, the thing that impacted me the most was seeing how you and your family navigated conflict. I've never seen it before. I've never seen that walked out before. And it was formational for him. 
And had he just come over for a meal and left, he would have never seen any of that. And, and his discipleship would have been hamstrung, is that the right word? It, it would have been like weakened because there was something in him that needed to see family, real family, honor God and honor each other in the way that they walk through conflict. So, one, we have mistaken hospitality for entertainment. Two, hospitality is costly. Hospitality is a discipline. And because hospitality is a discipline, it takes tension to grow. I love that principle. I like to work out, and there's this idea of time under tension. <laughs> You're laughing at me. <laughs> there's this idea of time under tension that the more time that you spend under tension, the greater capacity your muscle has to, to carry a load. And so because hospitality is a discipline, it requires tension to grow. And the tension that it requires to grow is at the hands of interruption. Interruption that stretches us. <laughs> interruption that stretches our capacity to be generous with our time and our space and our hearts. I've heard it said, and I agree, that <clears throat> the majority of our life, our, our real life, is actually made up of how we handle interruption. A lot of times we look at an interruption and we think, I wish this would go away so I could get back to my real life. But reality is the interruptions are real life. And how we navigate and manage interruptions are our real life. So how we take in and we navigate and we respond to the things and the people that seem like interruptions is important. It's the practice of hospitality. And it's, a, it's something that we can do in the daily rhythm of our life. So I encourage you, anytime something rubs up against you and you think, this is an interruption, ask yourself, how can I be hospitable to this person? It might be your kids. It might be your spouse. It might be the people at work. It might be a situation. Whatever it is. It should trigger the thing in your mind that says, okay, this interruption is really an invitation to be hospitable and to practice hospitality. Okay, I'm going to close out. Okay, we're going to do communion. You can come up. I have a quote I want to read. I don't want to try to land this plane if I can. I love this quote. This quote is in a book called Come to the Table. John Mark Hicks is quoting William Williman. He says this. Oh, this is good. When people look at the church and ask, are you Christ's body or shall we look for another? We have to point them to our table, to a conglomeration of sick, hurting people with the nobodies at the head eating like somebodies. And with the outcast invited in and filled with good things. If this isn't church, what is? What is? Can we, can we be this? Can we embody this? These words are really good. But, but we actually have to be the thing. We actually have to embody this. My heart longs. To see the day when I walk into this room or I walk into the courtyard and it looks like a dignity dinner where people are there and they're having their dignity restored. I want to see that. And I believe it's the heart of God. And I believe that this is the way that the Lord is going to expand his, his kingdom. We have to be the thing, guys. We have to. So I have a challenge for you as you go through your week. My first challenge would be to practice 
You can do this with very little skin in the game. Practice hosting Jesus well. Be hospitable to him. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you, to show you, Lord, I make space for you to wreck my schedule today. Interrupt my day at any moment. Host him well. From that place, host the people in your home, your spouse, your kids, your roommate. Host the people in your your tightest little personal bubble. And from there, reach out to people that are difficult for you. Okay? Think of one person in your life that you can be intentional with in pursuing hospitality. It doesn't have to be a meal. It can be a conversation where you are allowing yourself to be interruptible. Okay, it can be a conversation where you have intention in it. Okay, start there. We can all do these things. Okay. Does everybody have communion? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Oh, so I'm going to do the body, and Layla's going to do the blood. I don't know where the microphone is. Ah. <laughs> oh. I love the body. I love it through the lens of hospitality. I think that Jesus allowing his body to be broken on the cross is the ultimate of hospitality. Because in allowing his body to be broken, he made space for me. Because I was a stranger. And he made space for me to belong and to become. And he calls me family. Ephesians 2 says that he came to preach peace to those who are far off and those who are near. That he smashed the dividing wall. And it tells us that through him, we're not strangers anymore and we're not aliens. But we're actually fellow citizens with God's people and we're family members in God's household. He did that through the the breaking of his body. So Jesus, we honor this gift. We notice and we look to your extravagant hospitality. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Thank you for allowing your body to be broken for us, for making space. God, thank you for making room for strangers. God, thank you for seating us at the table. God, we look to your body and we remember. And we say, give us grace to do the same. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, God, that um, you allowed it to be shed so willingly for our sins. Um, you didn't even take a second guess, God, at it. Thank you that we're now able to live guilt-free and sin-free because of what you did for us on that cross. Um, thank you so much, Lord, for that. So we take this in remembrance of you and what you did for us.
I ask you, Lord, I, I hear your Holy Spirit, and I hear your invitation this morning. Thank you so much for that word. And Lord, 
we receive this word with gladness, gratitude, and even um, we see the road ahead and um, I see the uncomfortability of walking like you walked and having that same attitude and posture of hospitality at all times. And Lord, I, I personally ask you for the grace to walk this out. And I thank you for your invitation. And I believe there's grace in the invitation to say yes for us, Lord, as a, as a family here to live this out in a day-to-day -day basis. And I just thank you for your word. And we say yes to this, Lord. And whatever that looks like, we're looking to you, Jesus. Thank you for showing us the way through your example. You laid down your life and you humbled yourself and you washed our feet. Lord, teach us how to do that for one another. In Jesus' name.